this MDR, XDR, microorganisms, superbugs. Now we are left over with few salvage antibiotics. Among few, those few, polymyxin, tegocycline, and phosphomycin are the few. Today we'll discuss about one salvage antibiotic that is tegocycline. So basically, it belongs to the class tetracyclines and glycyl cyclines. Uh, among tetracyclines, few to name a few are tetracyclines, minocyclines, and doxycycline, which we re uh, regularly use. Among glycyclines, the only uh, member of this class is tetracycline. Uh, basically, it's a uh, bacterial protein synthesis inhibitor, which uh, binds to the 30s uh, bacterial ribosome subunit. Uh, its antimicrobial activity is mainly bacteriostatic, but it's bactericidal in some cases, like in Streptococcus pneumoniae and uh, Legionella. More active against a gram positive than gram negative, uh, but this has better, uh, tegocycline has better gram negative activity as compared to the tetracyclines. Among gram positives, it covers both MSSA and MRSA, enterococcus, including uh, vancomycin resistant enterococci, streptococcus pyogenes, penicillin susceptible streptococcus pneumoniae, and listeria. It's highly effective against Enterobacteriaceae, Acinetobacter, gram-negative anaerobes, Bacteroides fragilis, other anaerobes, and atypical organisms like uh, NTM, Mycobacterium abscessus, Fortitum chelonii complex. It covers Mycoplasma, Chlamydophila, then uh, Legionella, and other atypical organisms. It has reduced activity against Pseudomonas and members of the prote family, Proteus, Morganella, and Providencia. Its activity is also against those which came out to be susceptible to tetracyclines and also which came out to be resistant to tetracyclines. So uh, according to FDA, there are three indications to use uh, tetracyclines. These are community-acquired bacterial pneumonia, complicated skin and soft tissue infections, and intra-abdominal infections, mainly complicated ones. And as far as FDA recommends, the, for these three indications, empirical use of tetracyclines as a solo drug and also definitive solo drug treatment can be provided. Coming to the PKPD of uh, tegocycline, it has a long half-life ranging from 27 hours to 42 hours. It has a post-antibiotic effect. It exhibits time-dependent uh, killing. Doses, adult doses are 100 milligram loading dose followed by 50 milligram every 12 hourly. No dose adjustment is required for any renal impairment. But in cases of severe uh, hepatic impairment, uh, usually uh, the maintenance dose is reduced from 50 to 25 milligram per 12 hours. Optimal duration of therapy is 7 to 14 days. The uh, pediatric doses have yet not been uh, defined, but uh, FD has recommends some proposed pediatric dosimen. Uh, it's not recommended below the age group of 8, but 8 to 11 years. Uh, it can be given as a dose of 1.2 milligram per kg every 12 hours. And uh, from 12 to 17 years, it's 50 milligram every 12 hours. It's highly protein bound uh, antibiotic and it has a large volume of distribution. As soon as it is uh, administered, it moves immediately from blood to various tissue distribution. So the concentration of free drug in blood is very low. It's mainly concentrated in gallbladder and uh, alveolar macrophages. It readily causes CSF and also it causes placenta and enters fetal circulation and amniotic fluid. It is concentrated highly in bile, uh, breast milk, uh, primarily excreted by uh, biliary excretion and partially by renal excretion. Pregnancy category for this antibiotic is regarded as D. It has uh, risk in, for fetus in second and third trimester and breastfeeding uh, is also having potential toxicity. Coming to the adverse effects, it causes mainly gastrointestinal uh, adverse effect, nausea and vomiting. Few cases of photosensitivity reaction and a permanent discoloration of teeth, mainly if given uh, antenatal in the late trimesters or to any children in the age group of before eight years. Otherwise, it causes, in rare cases, it causes azotemia and uh, uh, FDA recommends, uh, according to a meta-analysis of clinical trial that all cause mortality was higher in patients which are treated with tegocycline as compared to the compared uh, comparators. So uh, FDA recommends that its tegocycline should be reserved for use only in situations where alternative treatment is not available and uh, 
the empirical and definite treatment as a monotherapy for tetracycline is only recommended for those three indications and it should not be used in cases of uh, diabetic foot ulcers and any hospital or nosocomial infection because it doesn't cover pseudomonas as a path. Uh, then uh, tetracycline in bacteremia patients, this is the uh, topic of discussion. Basically, uh, tetracycline is not recommended for use in primary bacteremia or in infective endocarditis, but it might be used in cases of secondary bacteremia uh, because uh, once the cause of primary cause of secondary bacteremia can be treated because it has an extensive tissue distribution, then secondary bacteremia can be taken care of. One example of, uh, is uh, like streptococcus pneumonia. If it causes a community acquired pneumonia followed by a, a bacteremia, then if you treat the community acquired pneumonia with tetracycline then bacteremia might be treated. And uh, clinicians should be uh, using tetracycline very cautiously if it is used for any indication that is beyond the primary three indications of tetracycline. Uh, then uh, another important use of tetracycline at present is uh, against carbapenem resistant or extremely drug resistant acinobacter bomani. It might be used as a salvage therapy for treatment of those uh, superbugs especially in ventilator-associated pneumonia because cholestine uh, solo do, uh, is quite ineffective in cases of ventilator-associated pneumonia because it's poor penetration to the lung parenchyma. Uh, and if other, no other antibiotics, uh, having better coverage is available as far as susceptibility is concerned. Uh, Tegocycline activity uh, against ESBLs uh, or carbapenemis resistant enterobacteriaceae then tegocycline is combined with cholestine, have been shown to have synergistic effect, but uh, uh, they may be used as a directed therapy only if, apart from tegocycline and polymyxin, none other uh, antibiotics which have gram-negative coverage seem to be effective. If used in these circumstances, uh, meta-analysis have proven that tegocycline should be used in a drug doses better or higher doses than what is recommended? It is recommended as a 50 milligram maintenance dose, but in this, if you need to cover those superbugs, this would be given in at a maintenance dose of 100 or 150 milligram. But a very good morning to you all. Today we are going to talk about this topic and experience and outbreak control of Nipah virus in Kerala in May 2018. Uh, today this topic is very pertinent because we expect these outbreaks of Nipah virus infection during winter. They usually persist from November to May uh, in our country. And in Bangladesh and in India region, this outbreak has been seen annually occurring. Maybe small clusters are there. So, and recently when it was seen in Kerala, it has jumped from Bangladesh and West Bengal region to Kerala. So it is showing a huge geographical jump. So uh, we should not expect that we are untouched by this. So let's see uh, how and what they did. So uh, this is the reference from where we have taken this topic. Um, in May, WHO, uh, uh, this uh, contagion movie in, uh, came into 2011, and WHO has already included Nipah virus as a global threat for pandemic. And we should know that, again, WHO has predicted that in this millennium, we should expect at least two new RNA viruses emerging as global threat annually. And this is one of the viruses which has a threat for pandemic. So everybody is working on it to contain it. Otherwise, right now, it is showing its presence only in developing countries. So uh, this was the news headlines in May 2018 in various newspapers. Panic grips Kerala as deadly Nipah virus suspected to have killed 12. Then Nipah outbreak fallout. Bahrain, UAE, uh, UAE banned fruit, vegetables from Kerala. Siliguri because it had experienced uh, uh, the outbreak in beginning in our country. So there was an alert for this. Then we lost a healthcare worker to it. 
And she was the initial few who came in contact with the index case. So we don't want such things happening in our setup. So people should be aware how to handle seriously critical cases. Because this patient, when he uh, was admitted in two different hospitals, he gave infection to at least nine people. There were nine primary cases in first hospital within one day. And next day, he was moved to hospital two, where he infected 10 cases. So um, it was also observed that most of the transmission to these primary cases occurred during most serious presentation of the case. So usually we see that when patient is very serious, he is not so mobile. And exposure to so many people doesn't occur. But that is the story. It is so interesting. We'll see how it occurred. So initially, uh, the outbreak was uh, uh, during 2nd to 29th May. Fortunately, it was contained rapidly because there was public outcry and rapid response team came forward and they were already having diagnostic facilities in that area because they had two years back suspected an outbreak uh, of NEPA in their area so they had all the reagents of PCR and ELISA so they could detect it very soon. Uh, when the clustering occurred in the family of encephalitis cases. So that is how it was early detected and contained. So there were 23 cases, and 18 cases were confirmed, and four were probable cases. So uh, transmission occurred in three hospitals. Uh, first hospital and second hospital uh, were the places where index case visited and transmitted the infection. And the third hospital was when one of the primary cases from first hospital get, got admitted in a private setup. Then case definitions were uh, made and suspected cases were having fever and at least had one of seven signs of symptoms like myalgia, headache, vomiting, cough, shortness of breath, uh, new uh, onset altered sensorium, and so on. Then uh, probable cases were uh, all who came in contact with confirmed NIV cases or died before the clinical samples could be collected. And then, of course, confirmed cases, they were confirmed uh, on molecular basis or serologically. So this is the scenario, this is hospital one, and uh, index case was hospitalized on 2nd May. And on 14th May, uh, here see, uh, and he died on 5th May. Index case was ho hospitalized in hospital one on 2nd May, and he died in hospital two on 5th May. Meanwhile, on 14th May, his brother, father, and aunt, they all simultaneously, on same day, they presented with same symptoms. Fever, breathlessness, and altered sense, and vomiting. And there was this history of a case had died, uh, their close relative had died 10 days back. Uh, then there were uh, this, uh, in hospital one, there was a staff nurse who came in contact with the patient. And then there were other these cases, one on next bed, one on opposite bed. Now, and then there were other three cases. We lost all these cases. Nine cases died uh, in hospital one. These were primary cases who came in contact with index case. Now, what was so interesting? See. Mother was present all along with the patient in this case, uh, along with other family members, but she didn't get infected. And what was so unique, she was um, covering her face all the time while she was in the hospital because she doesn't like the smell of the hospital. 
so that's why she was saved because she had kept her face covered throughout and uh, this is aunt she came in contact with the case when he was very serious this previous night to his death she had uh, come very close to his face doing some uh, you know uh, reciting some uh, holy mantra or something and uh, she uh, they are uh, this family is muslim uh, though she was wearing her burqa but she had removed it at that point of time so just one contact so close to the index case infected her then staff nurse she gave this patient injections and took bp and attended him and she wasn't wearing any pp so that is how she acquired it these patients they were on opposite or next bed very close contact but what was so interesting that rest of the 11 patients present in the same ward were not infected and who were not infected who were restricted to their they were so sick that they were not able to move and among these people uh, these cases there were people who were companion to patients and they tried to come and help this index case because index case was breathless he was coughing and he was vomiting so when he was vomiting so people were coming to support him you know and that is how these people uh, sorry they acquired uh, these people they acquired infection then this index case after 2 days he was moved to hospital to which is a medical college in and in emergency department he was in, uh, attended by a junior physician but he just examined him and there one of the trainee nurse he took his bp and gave him injection she got infected but she survived she was uh, uh, the only one who was initial contact and she survived then this patient because he had altered sensorium vomiting uh, his ct was and he was coming in the category of encephalitis uh, his ct was asked and he was taken to radiology department now he was taken to radiology department from emergency three times during 5 hours because initial two times they failed to get his ct because of coughing he was not able to uh, remain still so and that time he was crossing all these and he came in contact with at least 70 to 100 people present in that corridor and 10 people actually got in so uh, and so many of them died and one of the patient had come for his own ct from icu and that patient went back to icu and there he infected three more patients and one of the assistant in radiology department he also died who attended the patient okay who was trying to take his ct and make him stable so uh See, in only radiology department, there were so many because of this. And here, these are the cases. This I talked about that he went to ICU, and in ICU, another case, case uh, secondary case. This is case twenty one is secondary case. Okay, from these cases which developed the infection. Then, uh, I'll talk about these two in my next. they have given this picture uh, in their uh, article and this is very interesting so here is the uh, timeline how the index case went and this is index case this is his uh, uh, brother father aunt so uh, here we can see that this this is the index case he is hospitalized in this a uh, chc it is a community level health center and he is on the first bed near entrance so this 
was another reason to expose so many people because entrance was crossed by uh, all the people going or coming out of this ward. Then this is the uh, here third case. This is next bed, okay? And this is actually companion to this bed who came to help him. And opposite bed. Here is the eighth case who came to help him. See, this is the distribution of primary cases in the ward, that ward. It was 11-bedded ward, and rest all are his own relatives. Seven is the nurse who died. So this was the presentation at hospital one in one ward, and he remained there for almost one and a half day. Now here he was shifted. He remained in emergency. And here in emergency, one nurse got infected, but she survived. But here, see, this 11. This is a companion to another patient. So this is an attendant of another patient who was just a standby visitor. Okay. Then this is a corridor outside the CT room. And he was kept in the corridor. And while he was coughing, vomiting, then, see, uh, one patient who had come uh, for uh, 12. This is the case who had come to, he was visiting, he was here for his own CT. He went back, and in the ICU, he infected other three patients. And this is case number 10. He acquired infection here in hospital one. Got exposure here, and he was admitted in this uh, community health center. And on opposite bed, there was this secondary. So this is how the transmission and how they have evaluated this. They uh, had wonderful questionnaire. Uh, and they uh, isolated nearly 2,500 close contacts of all these patients. And they used CCTV footage to see movement of people in various areas and people who were coming in with the index case and primary case. And that is how they have uh, uh, assessed the situation and identified the cases and diagnosed. What was so interesting? One is mother. She was throughout there, but her face was covered. Similarly, no health, uh, this housekeeping staff who were cleaning that vomitus or he was coughing so much. They were there cleaning that area regularly. None of them got that. Why? What is the difference? Anybody? What usually housekeeping staff is wearing, which our nursing staff is usually not wearing? Face mask. So those people who were cleaning the bedside, they had a face mask. They didn't get the infection, though they cleared his blood. They were so close to that thing. But nursing staff who wasn't using that PP got infected. So this is timeline again, next case. And uh, uh, the first case, this is index case, and this attendant of the side bed and this opposite bed. These are the three cases from which samples could not be collected, and uh, they could not be confirmed. Um, and they are our probable cases in this case. And uh, you know, this patient on uh, opposite bed, he was an elderly man, and he was supposed to be discharged that day after some surgery. and. Uh, that day only he developed fever and breathlessness. So, he, yeah. so it happens like that. Just they have gone home healthy. So uh, what were the main uh, presentations in these cases? So it has a high case fatality rate with 91%, which is not seen in other uh, outbreaks. Uh, and only two people have survived. But they have long-term sequelae morbidity because it involves cortical and they still have those uh, 
uh, state complications. Then, fever was present in 100% patients. What was unique? That there was this respiratory involvement, which is usually in earlier outbreaks not seen in Zika virus. This time, and it is in uh, seen in Indian outbreaks, that respiratory and it was all the more severe in this outbreak. That's why there were so many uh, primary and secondary cases. Uh, then there were uh, other symptoms. An altered sensorium was again uh, next. And these were the etiologies suspected and for which they had fucked up these cases for encephalitis and respiratory tract infection. So let's see what is Nipah virus. So this is its distribution. It is a very young virus. It was first seen in Malaysia. And again, with a very unique distribution. Uh, and we'll talk about it. So actually, it belongs to paramyxoviruses. And again, in that, it is uh, under Henipa virus. These are two recent viruses, Hendra virus. This Hendra virus outbreak occurred in Australia in 2008. And Nipa virus outbreak occurred in Malaysia. But what is so interesting, in Malaysia, so there are right now two circulating strains of Nipa virus. One is uh, Malaysian and other, other is Bangladesh. And our virus is related to Bangladesh strain. That in Malaysia, they contained their outbreak in 2001. And till now, no other case occurred after that. That is so remarkable. And in our country, every year, we are seeing cluster of cases. So what is the difference? The difference is that in uh, Malaysian strain, the transmission was from pig to man. Whereas in our country, it is being seen that it is bat to man, and then man to man transmission is very high because of more involvement of respiratory tract and respiratory system, which is making it easier to spread. So uh, this is the uh, worldwide and this is basically in Australia this is the virus and this is how it is present in Bangladesh and in India two outbreaks one here that is Nadia and other here in Chiligudi have been seen and this is how it is transmitted from fruit bats which is Seropus species which is very common and either it can be acquired by eating the in, uh, food which has been uh, eaten by the bat, or the uh, main reason in Bangladesh they have observed is that sari, the palm sap they collect, and this is taken by these bats. They infect it with their saliva or excretion, and then it is transmitted to people. And this is the transmission. This was recently reported horses in Philippines in 2014. And this is the cycle which was pigs was seen in Malaysia. And why here such a lovely thing that they observed how they uh, reach pigs? Because they observed that in Malaysia, the mainly population is Muslim population. But they were spared. And all abattoir workers which were working uh, in pig farm, coming in contact with pigs, they were the case. They were index case. And there were no secondary man-to-man -man transmission there seen. So this is Silly Goody. Had in 2000 with 66 cases and 45 deaths. So mortality was 68%. In Nadia, it was in 7 with a mortality of so uh, what is the difference in these pain outbreaks that uh, the case fatality is a huge difference, and that is because of these two reasons, the transmission and respiratory. 
So here, uh, it, they, that was very less. So what was the key element of prevention of NIV? So early case detection, prompt alert to local health personnel, early management in isolation and care in the hospital or at home, then adequate and precise infection control measures in community, hospital, isolation, or among family caregivers, acute reporting, that is very important, accurate reporting, and then successful awareness. Uh, then this is also being done because this is our uh, trend there. They do take tardy, so we can't. So it is being said that they should collect in it in a container which has a narrow mouth so that bat cannot enter it, and they should use it after boiling or distillation. And of course, pig farmers and local livestock uh, officials should be alerted about the possibility of infection and caution taken. So these are the things that batteries human transmission. Human to human transmission, we all know that close physical contact, gloves and then domestic animal to human, again wearing gloves and while handling sick animals and their tissue. Then prevention of corpse to person transmission here. Avoid contact with corpse face. This is asked sometimes people from nursing, but can be done. Especially respiratory sickness and during transportation of the corpse from hospital to home. So I have tried to cover here what are the basic transmission based precautions. Since any outbreak can occur with any pathogen. So this is just a simple revision. There are hardly four slides. So uh, even with our influenza outbreak, and I think it is high time we stop calling it swine, it is flu. And the beauty is that we have a treatment. And recently, FDA has approved another drug, that is Baloxavir, in December 2018. Hardly one month. Another drug has also and it has a wonderful prevents mortality and and apart from all those high risk groups healthcare workers an important group who should receive finally vaccinate yourself protect your own self and in our country it should be done well in advance that is we should vaccinate ourselves in august and or September that we are protected for rest of the six months. And it, even if you acquire, though its uh, protection is 40 to 60, lasts only six months to one year. Remember that it will prevent the complication and mortality. So do get vaccinated. And these are the precautions to talk about which are transmission based. Standard precautions. Where are they used? So these were our old universal precaution. Then contact precaution. Okay, so these are basically for MDROs. And here's the list. Okay, enteric infections. And so you should know where contact precautions are required this list all nursing staff should be aware of this then droplet precautions and what is here influenza a or b it is not under airborne precaution it is only avian influenza where we need n95 mask so we must know if we remember this rest all becomes easy because only two are transmitted that is droplet Infections and airborne infections, they are transmitted through, through respiratory route. And N95 masks are recommended for airborne precaution. That is chickenpox, disseminated herpes zoster, measles, tuberculosis, SARS, and avian influenza. Or BSL-4 agents, okay? So, which are exotic and they are not so uh, common. 
So what are contact precautions? Contact precautions are where you just need direct contact spreads the infection. And what are these? See, MRSA, VRE, adenovirus, all enteric pathogens, okay, then uh, shingles, puppy simplex, para-influenza, RSV, lice, KBs, chicken pox, then symptomatic until all lesions crusted and dried. So there we need direct contact precautions. So what are those? Hand washing, hygiene, gown, and gloves, okay? We, even if we don't wear masks, it's okay. But when housekeeping staff is cleaning a room with a patient infected with MRSA, he should wear masks because by uh, picking up the uh, linen, the aerosol generated contains MRSA and uh, he can become a carrier. Okay. Then what is this airborne and droplet infection? So we should understand when a person speaks, coughs or sneezes, he produces these large aerosols or droplets, nuclei. So they within few seconds they drop down on the floor. They don't remain suspended in the air for so long. But when they are smaller in size, less than 10 micron, see, uh, then they can remain suspended in the air. And they can, the smaller they become, they remain suspended longer and they can travel distances. So there we need airborne precautions, okay? When the size is less than 5 micron and it can easily reach our alveoli as well because of their size. So, um, there's a difference in droplet precautions. So droplet precautions are that keep a distance with the patient of one meter, and that is why that is the distance kept, kept between two beds in the hospital, and a simple surgical mask is enough. And influenza comes under this category. So droplet precautions are these, patient placement, either a private room, and if it is not available, cohorting of the patient. Okay? And maintain spatial separation of at least three feet from the patients and visitors. Then respiratory protection is only a simple surgical mask. And when patient is being transported out for investigations, like visiting a radiology department, patient should be put on the surgical. So this is droplet precaution. This is required for influenza. Then airborne precautions, here's the, uh, this for, uh, the causative agents are mnemonic, so measles, chicken pox, herpes, osteotuberculosis. What are the protections? Single negative pressure room. We don't have these facilities in our country. Six to 12 air exchanges per hour. Wear a respirator, that is N95 mask. Then mask must be worn by a client when leaving the room. If he's leaving this negative pressure room, then they should wear it. And don't expect your the patient to wear a N95 mask. Why? Because see, it, there are certain limitations with the use of this mask. There should be a proper fit, usage and maintenance, and fit test should be done when wearing, and uh, cannot be worn by individuals with facial hair that disturbs the seal of the respirator. Then it will not protect you from these. Then. It should be replaced when wet, damaged, soiled, or contaminated. And it may be uncomfortable if used for extended period. Ideally, they recommend the uh, OSHA guidelines are two to three hours. Our staff working in BSL-3 and 4 labs, they should not be kept there with these masks on beyond three hours. Beyond that, because there is oxygen concentration is less with these masks on. So, uh, that is important. So this is about use of N95 mask. Respirator fit checks are very important, otherwise you are into false sense of security. So experience is a hard teacher because she gives the test for the lessons afterwards. Take care of yourself. Thank you so much for your patience. Any questions?
So join us for a tea. There you can ask me if you are interested in asking. Thank you.